the Communications Coordinator at the Conference of European Churches. Today we are coming to you from the residence of the Serbian Orthodox Metropolitan of Serbia and Croatia. We will be bringing you a one-on-one -on -one interview with CEC General Secretary Father Heiki Hutunen. Father Heiki took up the role of General Secretary at the Conference of European Churches early this year in 2016. Father Heike, today we are speaking to a religious audience under the auspices of Bishop Irina of, of Bachka. May I ask you simply to introduce yourself to the audience, to tell them about yourself, maybe a little bit about your education or service to the church, and eventually how you came to Kek. My name is Heike, which is Fyodor in Slavonic, and uh, I come from Finland, which is a country in Northern Europe and um, I'm an Orthodox priest. I've been serving as a parish priest, but also in, in many interchurch tasks, um, uh, and uh, also in church youth work. And for the past nine years, I had been General Secretary of the Council of Churches in Finland, and that is my connection, how I then came, came to serve in the Conference of European Churches ten months ago. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of the Conference of European Churches? How did it come to be? Was it part of a broader movement? And, and how did it, it, it come into existence in the structures that it, we know it today? The Conference of European Churches is, uh, uh, has a very uh, particular story of its own. It is, of course, part of the, um, the ecumenical movement, as we call it, the, um, uh, the, act, the movement of Christian churches to come closer to each other, to, to understand better each other, and to work together in areas where we can cooperate. And this movement has a history of 100 years. And um, in Europe, uh, there was a special need for churches' cooperation during the Cold War. And already in 1959, European churches took the very courageous initiative to come together over the, the so-called Iron Curtain. And that was the Conference of European Churches, which was started through many difficulties and despite many hurdles uh, in, in the end of 50s and early 60s. One of the early gen General Assemblies had to be held on a, on a ship in the North Sea because not all the participants could receive visas in the hosting country. So we have a very exciting history in, in that sense. Uh, this is the classical cooperation between churches about theological issues, about spiritual things, about pastoral work for our people, and then about understanding each other. Our, conference has another route also, and that is the presence of Christian churches in European institutions. And that's also quite exciting because it was started by people who were working in these institutions, people who were committed Christians in their own churches and who wanted to help the churches to have a voice in the EU and in the Council of Europe. So that's the other background we have. And today, as we, we serve our churches, we, we are truthful to these, faithful to these two, two kinds of backgrounds we have. And so who is Keck? Who, who are the members of Keck? Mm. It is a, a confederation or a fellowship of churches. We are 115 churches at this moment who come from the um, Orthodox, Protestant, Anglican and Old Catholic traditions. This means that the Roman Catholic Church is not a member in Keck and they have their own uh, organizations 
who work in the same fields and we cooperate with them, of course, to have a combined Christian voice when, when possible. So we have a very broad background and one of our bigger member churches is the Serbian Orthodox Church. And we talked a little bit then about the, the breadth of Christian traditions represented. Is it also equally broad as far as the geography of Europe goes? Oh yes, yes. We are uh, represented in 40 different countries. So we are much broader than the European Union, although the European Union plays an important role in our work. Mm -hmm. But we must always remember that our member churches come from uh, the geographical breadth of Europe, from Greenland to Armenia or from the Canary Islands to Siberia, as, as we could say. And so then what is the mission of Keck? And, and how is this changing or emerging as you have experienced it? The, um, I think we have a double mission. The first one is to help the churches to know each other and to understand each other, to listen to each other and to work together. And of course this work uh, has, a, has a long background and we have achieved many things. But of course we have many things still to achieve. And we know that in order to achieve this goal we need to, we, we need to be very faithful to ourselves. Each one of us has to represent his or her own tradition in the most gen uh, genuine way. Uh, an Orthodox has to be a real Orthodox. A Baptist has to be a real Baptist. And a Lutheran needs to be a real Lutheran. A Reformed needs to be very uh, genuine in his or her Reformed tradition. And because we think and we know that uh, in the, at the core of each Christian church, there is Christ. We can discover Christ in the way um, an other Christian is following him, and we can learn from the other Christian. Uh, we believe that this cooperation is possible, and uh, we actually believe that it is commanded by God. By this, we don't mean to sort of diminish or ignore the differences we have. And that is why there's a lot of work, because we need to, need to respect each other, we need to listen to each other, we need to learn from each other. And every Christian tradition has a specific gift to bring. And in order to bring this gift, we have to be true to ourselves. So it's, it's this kind of a double uh, task that we have as Christians. This is the sort of the lofty, uh, high, uh, goal of our work in Keck. Then of course this will to be one in Christ needs to be translated also into cooperation, into uh, friendship with each other so that we as churches can also learn from each other on the practical level and cooperate on the practical level. And one of these practical levels for us is to work with the European institutions to try to bring the voice of the churches to the work of the European Union and also the Council of Europe. And, and in this way to, to truthfully serve the gospel of Christ, which needs to be at the core of everything we do. So then on a very practical day-to-day -day level, what does the work of the Conference of European Churches look like? What kind of issues do you find common, common ground on? Well, we have just uh, accomplished a, a very successful seminar on minority churches. And if we say Keck has 115 member churches, we need to recognize that 100 of them are small churches. So the question of the rights of small churches, the question of minority rights, and not only for our member churches, but for everyone, that is one of the areas where we need to be sensitive and active. There are other areas like, uh, as, as uh, we go back to Brussels now, there will be a seminar on migration and how to face the question about the fear of the 
of the other, the fear of the newcomer or somebody who comes from a different background, a different religion, and how do we as Christians react to this new situation? You mentioned the reason why we are here in Croatia, which is the Conference on Religious Minorities in Culturally Diverse Societies. What were your impressions from the conference? Uh, I was very impressed by the high level of the contributions and of, also of the high level of interest from uh, both the government of Croatia but also the government of Serbia who were represented in our seminar and I could feel on many levels the need to discuss uh, minorities across the borders in, in this part of Europe and, and how, how could they listen to each other and how could the ma majority listen to the minority and as it is everywhere, in one country, one church is minor, minority, in the other country it's a majority. Mm -hmm. And this happens everywhere in Europe. And that's why this should help us to, to listen to different voices. But it's not always so easy. So, so I think this seminar did something f for that purpose. And, and what were some of the most important conclusions? The participants have released a communique highlighting some calls to action that might help advance mm -hmm. the, the conversation and to make sure that it goes beyond these two days. Well, for me, the, the important message was a very simple one. Uh, and I think it was that, um, that our governments and, and, uh, and uh, states have agreements um, w with each other, they have laws and we need to apply those laws. We have to take the principles of equality and uh, rights of minorities from paper into practice. Mm -hmm. I think that was for me the, the most concrete message mm -hmm. of this seminar, that uh, there are good laws and good principles but the practices are not always on the same level. Our setting here in Croatia might inform Keck work in another way. Uh, Croatia is a significant Roman Catholic majority country and you briefly mentioned earlier that we have some cooperation between Keck and Roman Catholic partners. Can you tell us more about the European and international collaboration between Keck and our Roman Catholic partners? Uh, there is collaboration on many levels. As, as the Conference of European Churches, we have two major Catholic partners. Uh, one is the Council of Catholic Bishops' Conferences in Europe, the CCEE, which is very similar to CEC in terms of its membership. It, they have 42 countries represented. And uh, in terms of their work, which is directed to the educational and pastoral work of the Catholic Church. But then we have another partner in Brussels, and this, this one is, is not based in Brussels, but in Brussels there's a specific commission for Catholic bishops' conferences for their work in the EU. Mm -hmm. And this is a very specific organization uh, working for the uh, particular interests of the Catholic Church in terms of EU legislation or EU policy. And that is sometimes very useful for us, so that we can relate to them and work together for common goals. But I should add that um, in the Keck work, we also relate to the National Councils of Churches, which are uh, co organizations for the cooperation of churches in particular countries. And these councils often include Roman Catholic membership. Uh, earlier it was typical that the Catholic Church as well as the Orthodox Church was less interested in cooperation in countries where we are majority mm -hmm. and more interested in countries where the Catholics or the Orthodox are minority. Mm -hmm. But this is changing. So in more and more countries uh, even the Catholic majority church is part of the Council of Churches where the smaller churches are cooperating in their country and likewise the Orthodox churches in European countries. So in this way our cooperation with the Catholic Church is growing all the time. And you're an Orthodox Christian. 
maybe you can help our viewers understand a little bit more about the Orthodox um, situation within the Conference of European Churches and inform them a little bit more about Orthodox, Orthodox participation and mm -hmm. how they participate in the life of ecumenical uh, activity in Europe. Um, the Conference of European Churches has several Orthodox Churches as its member. The Serbian Orthodox Church is one of them, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, the Church of Greece, and the Church of Romania, for example, of the bigger churches, and also then smaller Orthodox churches like mine from Finland uh, are members of the Conference of European Churches. And I think in ecumenical uh, um, context, uh, the Orthodox, that in order to contribute something to cooperation with other Christians, we have to be ourselves. If, if our Orthodox Church, or if our Orthodox faith is, is living and, and uh, if it uh, influences myself as a person, then I have something to share. It's uh, like uh, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople said that uh, people who are, um, who are most, um, how did he put it? Um, people who are most uh, uh, negative to other faiths are usually weakest in their own faith. Mm. So if you have to criticize others very much, it usually means that you have something that you need to somehow strengthen in yourself. But if your own faith can be living and powerful, then you, have, uh, you can relate to others in a relaxed way. Mm. So I think this is the basic, <laughs> basic approach mm -hmm. for Orthodox Christians and probably for others too mm -hmm. in, in ecumenical cooperation. Mm -hmm. Of course, the Orthodox churches in Europe have some particular issues, some particular interests and some particular problems uh, where we as Conference of European Churches need to listen to them. Mm -hmm. And we need to help them to find answers and solutions to those situations. And in, in many cases we have been able to do that. I think that one, one of the crucial areas which is, which is of great importance to all churches in Europe now is migration. Mm. And the Church of Greece is one of the churches on the front line. And we need to listen to their experience, we need to support them in their struggle in this situation, and we, we need to we need to learn from that situation and we need to try to spread that learning to others. And um, in two years' time, the Conference of European Churches will have its General Assembly in Novi Sad, in Serbia. This is the most important uh, decision-making body in our organizations. It is a, a meeting of about, one, about 500 people. And, all of, and these 500 people from all around Europe will come to Novi Sad in 2018. And I th I'm sure that uh, the uh, location in Novi Sad will influence our meeting. And, and that the, the kind of cooperation that exists among the churches in Novi Sad and the way the Serbian Orthodox Church relates to the other churches in, in Novi Sad will influence our meeting. It will be a contribution, it will be a gift from Novi Sad. You mentioned an issue that really has deeply touched the lives of all of our churches in Europe, uh, the, the migration issue, the, the refugee crisis as some are calling it, and particularly in this region it has been, has been difficult and has really required our churches to provide a strong response. What is the Conference of European Churches doing to journey with with those who are both on the front lines of the refugee crisis, but also with refugees and asylum seekers themselves. We can say a, a few basic things about the migration situation. Uh, maybe the first thing we need to say is that if we look, look in the Bible, the answer is very clear. Uh, the Bible tells us, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, that we must receive the stranger. When people come to our door, whoever they are, wherever they come from, 
we need to receive them, we need to help them. Uh, the stranger is, for God, there are no strangers. Everyone is a child of God. And that should be our attitude as Christians. So that is our first level of response, that we support those parishes, those monasteries, those communities who receive all these people who come. And we need to organize the churches in order to help this reception to happen. That's the first thing. Uh, the second point one needs to make is to look at the whole world. As Christians, we are members of, of uh, a family which is global. As Christians, we're not only Serbians or not only Croatians, we're not only Finnish, we're not only Belgian, we are and not only Europeans. We are members of a family which is global. And therefore, if we look at the refugee situation, a very small part of the refugees in the world are coming to Europe. The entire European Union has received approximately the same amount of refugees last year as Lebanon. Lebanon is a small country with 4.5 million citizens and they have 2 million refugees. So if we speak of refugee crisis, we need to put some relativity into that. Uh, that is, uh, is the second point. And the third point one needs to make is that uh, the churches in Europe, uh, the Conference of European Churches, and our very close partner, which is the uh, Churches Commission for Migrants in Europe, who have a very high expertise in these questions, we would like the European countries to show more solidarity to each other. Mm. When these people arrive in Europe, of course, even two million people, not even so many at, at this point, even this number of people can be a crisis if we are not dealing with them in a sensible way. And I think we are not, because uh, they come in Europe to look for a better life, a safe life, a better future for their children. And, and this, we believe, is possible in Europe. But if these people are left to the, to the margins of Europe, on Greek islands, on Lampedusa, on, on the Spanish coast perhaps in the future, uh, this does not help them. But the, the European countries, the European Union countries, need to share responsibility. And this seems to be a very difficult political task for our countries, for various reasons. But uh, I think that uh, in this way uh, we maybe we are not entitled to speak about the refugee crisis in Europe, as I said, but rather we should speak about a crisis of solidarity, crisis of community within Europe. And this is a serious one which, which we need to deal with. And we as churches, our voice needs to say that this, the crisis can only be dealt with if we do it together, otherwise not. So in light of this crisis, we also have an ongoing outcomes of an economic crisis that started nearly a decade ago now, and also we're seeing political crisis in a certain sense, not the least of which surrounding the existence and the nature of the European Union. How does Keck then find a hopeful voice or a source of hope in the midst of seemingly very difficult times? I think we, we need to look at things from a broader perspective. And uh, uh, for the Conference of European Churches, European unity or the European Union or, or the so-called European project are not ends in themselves. They may be good tools for our countries and for our nations to achieve a better life together. But uh, the gospel and our faith in God and our hope is, is broader and deeper than that. And now that uh, the European Union is facing challenges, political challenges with the exit of Great Britain from, from EU, and, and how the economic crisis has not really been dealt with in Southern Europe uh, and the migration situation. 
uh, I think we as Christians would need to be able to raise our, our horizon from not looking to the everyday political situation and to look a little bit beyond and to see, see the, uh, the landscape uh, from a little bit higher uh, view. And, and in this way, for example, uh, the Conference of European Churches, we need to remind ourselves that we are not an organization only for the European Union, we are broader. Our member churches are in 40 countries and we need to, to remember that our base, our membership base is like this. And then the motivation, our, our ba the base for our work is in the gospel. And that is yet broader. And as Christians, as I, as I said earlier, we have to always remember that we belong to the family of humanity, the children of God everywhere in this world. So in this way, uh, we need to be reoriented with these motivations. And, and in this way, we may discover our identity in a stronger way, and we may have something to say to the political decision makers or our our countrymen and uh, wherever we are. And then if, if we can do this, then we have something that where we can serve the churches in Europe. Our setting here in, in Zagreb has been rich in many ways and we have learned a lot from the local context. And, and one of the ways that we have enjoyed our time here is that we have been on the receiving end of lovely hospitality from Metropolitan Perfurier. Um, what are your impressions of meeting here in this venue? Um, learning very much. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, um, it's a very exciting uh, uh, exercise to, to learn to know the, the, the Western Balkan countries. Of course, one has read the news uh, and one ha has some knowledge about the tragic uh, events here in the 1990s and in the way that uh, the political relations have developed. One has something knowledge, some knowledge about the churches in their, in their older history in this area. And then I personally have had the chance to, be, to, to know many people from this area and to be friends with them. And, um, and it's, it's a very exciting experience uh, and a very mixed experience, because there's the, there is the political reality which uh, has some very uh, shadowy sides and which is interesting to follow as it develops and one hopes it develops for the better. And, and then there is the richness of the cultures encountering from, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and, uh, and you know, the richness of the, the table and, and that leads us to the, to the most important thing which is the hospitality and the encounter with, with friends and, and the kind of cordial way we have been received and the kind of uh, um, deep um, human encounter which we can experience which, which is somehow the crown of, of this experience, which has so many colors and so many, so many sides to it. And um, as we are preparing for our General Assembly in Novi Sad, as I said, it's, it's very exciting to do it in this context. Father Heike, we thank you for your time and for this interview, and we wish you all the best in your continued leadership in the Conference of European Churches, especially as you prepare for the Assembly in Novi Sad. Thank you.